Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to lesson number 10 in the series on Genesis. It's titled Jacob Israel, ready for teaching on June 4, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 28. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these amazing stories from the book of Genesis. We thank you for the life of Jacob and how in this story of his life we see your grace. And this week we see your grace just so boldly displayed. And as we look at things such as Jacob's time of trouble, what actually happened to him, how he became Isaac, Lord, it doesn't matter where we are, but we know that we can depend on you. And it doesn't matter how severe our situation, we know that you were there to provide your grace, your love and your comfort. Whether we live in Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic or Pitcairn Island in Samoa in the South Pacific or Madagascar in the Indian Ocean or Guam and Hawaii in the North Pacific or the Caribbean Islands, in the Atlantic and the Falkland Islands in the Atlantic and Papua New Guinea in the Pacific and the Seychelles in India, Indian Ocean. Lord, wherever we live, whether it be on land or sea, that we know that your name is glorified in your word. And as we open it this week, may we not just see stories, but may we see you and your love and your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Genesis 32, verse 28. Let's read that again. And he said, Your name shall be no longer called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. The family saga of Jacob continues, both the good and the bad, yet through it all the hand of God and his faithfulness to the covenant promises are revealed. This week follows more of Jacob, now that he had left Laban and, returning home, had to face Esau, the victim of Jacob's treachery. What would his brother, so grievously wronged, now do to him? Fortunately for Jacob, amid the fear of what was coming, the Lord God of his fathers appeared again to him in an incident that was a precursor to what would later become known as the time of Jacob's trouble, as we read in Genesis 30 verses 5 to 7. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labour with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labour and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And that night Jacob, the supplanter, became Israel, a new name for a new beginning, a beginning that would ultimately lead to the creation of a nation itself named after him. In other words, despite all that happens, the story of the patriarchs and their family is told in Scripture in order to show us that God is faithful to fulfil what He has promised and that He will do so despite what at times seems to be nothing but His people doing all that they can to stop that fulfilment. Sunday, May 29, Wrestling with God Gone from Laban, Jacob soon has another experience with God. Knowing that his brother Esau is coming with 400 men, as it says in Genesis 32 verse 6, Jacob prays fervently to the Lord, even though he acknowledges in verse 10 that I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Jacob truly has a better understanding of what grace was about. And how does the Lord respond? 
Read Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31, and Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. What is the spiritual significance of this amazing story? Genesis 32, beginning at verse 22. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over, Penuel the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. And Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favour from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. Jacob is distressed understandably so, by what is happening, and after doing what he can to protect his family, he camps for the night. He is then suddenly attacked by a man, it says in verse 24 of Genesis 32. This is a term that can have special connotations evoking the divine presence, as we read in Isaiah 53 verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Daniel used it to refer to the heavenly priest Michael in Daniel 10 verse 5. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of upaz. It also was the word used by Joshua to depict the commander of the Lord's army, who was the Lord Yahweh himself in Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Indeed, amid the fighting, it must have been obvious to Jacob that he was struggling with God himself, as his words, I will not let you go unless you bless me, in Genesis 32:26 revealed. Yet, his fervent clinging to God, his refusal to let go, also revealed his passionate desire for forgiveness and to be right with his Lord. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 197, we read, The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. End of quote. And the evidence that he had been forgiven was the change of his name from the reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. Your name, said the angel, shall no longer be called Jacob the supplanter, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Genesis 32 verse 28. And so to finish the day. 
What has been your experience as far as wrestling with God goes? What does it mean to do that, and why is it at times important that we have this kind of experience? Monday, May 30, The Brothers Meet From Peniel, the face of God, we read in Genesis 32.30, the place where he had this experience with God, Jacob moves now to meet with his brother. After 20 years of separation, Jacob sees him coming with 400 men, as we'll read in Genesis 33 verse 1. Jacob is worried and therefore prepares himself and his family for whatever might happen. Read Genesis chapter 33. What connection is there between Jacob's experience of seeing the face of God at Peniel and Jacob's experience of seeing the face of his brother? What is the implication of this connection in regard to our relationship with God and our relationship with our brothers, whoever they may be? Genesis 33, beginning at verse 1. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants, and he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes, and saw the women and children, and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I meet? And he said, These are to find favour in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favour in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has graciously dealt with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me, and if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favour in the sight of the Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for one hundred pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it Elohe Israel. Jacob bows himself seven times before his brother in verse 3, whom he calls several times my Lord in Genesis 33 verses 8 13 and 15, and with whom he identifies himself as his servant. Genesis 33 verse 5. We'll compare that with Genesis chapter 32, 
verse 4, And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. And verse 18, Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. And verse 20, And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. Significantly, Jacob's seven bows echo his father's seven blessings in Genesis chapter 27, 27 to 29. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of the heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be every one who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Furthermore, when he bows, he specifically reverses his father's blessing about nations bowing down to you. As we read in verse 29, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. It is as if Jacob's intention was to pay his debt to his brother and return the blessing that he had stolen from him. We look at Genesis 33 verse 11. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. When Esau saw his brother against all expectations, he ran to Jacob and instead of killing him, he kissed him and they wept, we read in Genesis 33 verse 4. Later, Jacob commented to Esau, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, in verse 10. The reason for Jacob's extraordinary statement was his understanding that Esau had forgiven him. The Hebrew verb, Ratsa, R-A-T-S-A-H, or pleased, in verse 10, is a theological term referring to any sacrifice that is pleasing, accepted by God, which then implies divine forgiveness. As we read in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 27, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. And Amos chapter 5 and verse 22. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offering, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Jacob's experience of God's forgiveness at Peniel where he saw the face of God, is now repeated in his experience of his brother's forgiveness, which he identifies as if he saw the face of God. Jacob lives a second peniel, the first one preparing for the second one. Jacob has been forgiven by God and by his own brother. Truly, he now must have understood even more than before the meaning of grace. And so to finish the day, what have you learned about grace from how others, besides the Lord, have forgiven you? Tuesday, May 31, The Violation of Dinah Now that Jacob has reconciled with his brother, he wants to settle in the land of Canaan in peace. The word shalem, S-H-A-L-E-M, or safety, used in Genesis 33 verse 18, from the word shalom, S-H-A-L-O-M, peace, for the first time, characterizes his journey. Let's read that, Genesis 33, verse 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. 
After having purchased a piece of land from the inhabitants, as we read in verse 19, and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for one hundred pieces of money, he erects an altar there, showing his faith and his realisation of how dependent upon the Lord he really is. For every one of the sacrifices offered, there was an act of worship. Yet, for the first time in his life, Jacob, or Israel, is exposed to the troubles of settling in the land. Like Isaac at Gihar with Abimelech in Genesis 26, 1-33, Jacob tries to find accommodation with the Canaanites. Let's read that story in Genesis chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, because he thought, Lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac, showing endearment to Rebekah his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarrelled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, because they quarrelled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarrelled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be beautiful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahazath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me, and have sent me away from you? But they said, 
We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the next day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug, and he said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Read Genesis chapter 34. What happened to upset his plans for a peaceful existence? Genesis 34, beginning at verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife, and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, Let me find favour in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father, and spoke deceitfully, because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honourable than all the household of his father. And Hamor and Shechem his son came to the gate of their city, and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised, as they are circumcised." Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of this city. Now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, Each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field and all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives they took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. 
Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a harlot? The story of this sordid incident highlights the ambiguity of the characters and of their actions. The sensual Shechem, who violates Dinah, also is characterised as sincere and loving Dinah, and he wants to try to make amends. He is even willing to undergo the covenant rite of circumcision. Meanwhile, Simeon and Levi, who present themselves as the defenders of God and his commandments, and who resist intermarriage with the Canaanites, resort to lies and deception in verse 13, and are ready to kill and plunder. We read in Leviticus 19.29, Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. And then Genesis 34, verses 25 to 27. Now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob... Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. Their actions were not only reprehensible, why not punish the one man who had done it? but also had the potential to cause many more problems. As for Jacob, he only is concerned with peace. When the rape of his daughter is reported to him, he does not say anything, as we read in verse 5, and Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. However, after he hears about what his sons have done, he openly chides them because of what could follow. In verse 30, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. And so to finish the day. Again and again we see deceit and deception as well as acts of kindness and grace in these accounts. What does this tell us about human nature? Wednesday, June 1, Prevailing Idolatry Read Genesis chapter 34, verse 30, through to chapter 35, verse 15. What lessons can we take about true worship from what happened here? Genesis 34, beginning at verse 30, Then and Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a harlot? Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. And Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us rise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was with the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. 
So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bukath. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. Immediately after Jacob's complaint that his peace with the Canaanites had been compromised in Genesis 34.30, and after his two sons were rebuked in the same verse, God urges Jacob to leave Shechem and return to Bethel in order to renew his covenant. Indeed, the Lord tells him that once he gets there, he needs to build an altar. Meanwhile, the first thing recorded after God's command is Jacob's telling his people to put away the Canaanite idols, which had been taken in the plunder of the city of Shechem, and the household goods that had been stolen by Rachel, as we read in Genesis 31.19. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. And verse 32, With whomever you find your gods, do not let them live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. All this too is crucial to the idea of the covenant with God. These idols had been kept and probably worshipped in spite of Jacob's commitment to God. It was not enough for Jacob to leave Shechem in order to escape Canaanite influence. Jacob had to get rid of the idols within the camp and in the hearts of his people. The process of repentance consists in more than a physical move from one place to another or a move from one church to another. Most important, it is that we seek by God's grace to purge the idolatry in our hearts regardless of where we live because we can make idols out of just about anything. When Jacob obeys God and proceeds according to God's commandment, God finally intervenes and the terror of God, in verse 5, affects all the people around them, and they do not dare attack Jacob. Jacob is then ready to worship with all the people who were with him, we read in verse 6, suggesting that the family unity has been restored. Jacob gives this place the name El Bethel, a reminder of his dream of the ladder, a sign that the connection between heaven and earth, which had been broken for some time, has now been restored. The emphasis is, this time, on the God of Bethel rather than on the place itself. This personal note resonates again when God reminds Jacob of his name, Israel, in verse 10, with the double promise that this blessing implies... Jacob's blessing first means fruitfulness, the transmission of the messianic seed and the generation of many nations, as you read in verse 11. And second, it points to the promised land. Verse 12, The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. And so to finish the day. What are subtle ways that idolatry can find its way into our hearts, and what can we do about it? Thursday, June 2, The Death of Rachel
Read Genesis chapter 35, verses 15 to 29. What other woes did Jacob face within his dysfunctional family? Let's read Genesis 35, beginning at verse 15. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel laboured in childbirth, and she had hard labour. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labour, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eda. And it happened, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjath Abra, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. As soon as Jacob leaves Bethel, three interrelated incidents mark the last step of his journey toward the promised land. Jacob's last son is born, Rachel dies, and Reuben Jacob's first son by Leah sleeps with Jacob's concubine. Though the text doesn't say why the young man would do something so evil, it could have been that he wanted to somehow defile the birth of Jacob's last son and to humiliate the memory of Rachel. We just don't know. The birth of Jacob's last son is linked to Bethlehem, as we read in verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem, which is within the confines of the promised land. This birth is, then, the first fulfilment of God's promise for the future of Israel. The midwife prophetically addresses Rachel with the very words God used to reassure Abraham, do not fear. We read that in verse 17, and we're going to compare that with Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Significantly, Jacob changes the name that the dying Rachel had given to her son, Ben-Oni, meaning son of my sorrow, to signify her pain, into Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand, perhaps implying the direction of the south in order to express his hope in the promised land and all that God said he would do for his people after they had settled there. Yet, during this time, Reuben has sexual relations with Bilhar, his father's concubine, and Rachel's maidservant, as you read in Genesis thirty-five twenty-five. The sons of Bilhar, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali, and Genesis chapter 30 and verse 3. So she said, Here is my maid Bilhar, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. We just don't know why he performed this scandalous act, other than as another example of human depravity. Amazingly, Jacob does not respond to this horrible violation, even though he is told about it in verse 22. And it happened, when Israel dwelt in the land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Perhaps at this point in his life, Jacob trusts that God will fulfil his word despite the sin and evil at times that goes on around him. 
It is this precise lesson of faith that is implied in the list of Jacob's twelve sons, who will be the ancestors of Israel, not the most savoury and kindest of people, as we will see. Genesis 35, verses 22 to 26. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Padan Aram. Yet, despite all the problems, all the dysfunction, even outright evil, such as Reuben's sin with Bilhah, God's will was going to be fulfilled through this family, no matter how messed up this family really was. And so to finish today, despite human error, God's ultimate purposes will be fulfilled. Imagine what would happen if people cooperated, if they obeyed him. How much more easily, that is, with less human suffering and stress and delay, could God's will then be accomplished? Friday, June 3. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 201 to 203, we read, Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass just before Christ's second coming. Such will be the experience of God's people in their final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test their faith, their perseverance, their confidence in his power to deliver them. Satan will endeavour to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. They will have a deep sense of their shortcomings, and as they review their lives, their hopes will sink. But, remembering the greatness of God's mercy and their own sincere repentance, they will plead his promises made through Christ to helpless, repenting sinners. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. They will lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel, and the language of their souls will be, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin, but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, why is Jacob's weakness the occasion for God's grace? How does Jacob's experience relate to Paul's statement, When I am weak, then I am strong, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10? And two, why do you think the Bible reveals so many sordid details about the lives of many of its characters? What point could be made from doing this? What message can we take from it? Three, dwell more on the question of idolatry. What are the idols of our culture, our civilization? How can we make sure we aren't worshipping anyone or anything other than the Lord? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Double Answer to Prayer and it's by Andrew McChesney. 
The first-year theology student ran to the worship room at Zakoski Adventist University south of Moscow, Russia. Falling on his knees, he prayed, Lord, why are you blessing me? I am so sinful. Twenty-year-old Vadim Antyushin felt an overwhelming sense of his unworthiness of God's blessings. He felt unworthy to study at the university and of the calling to become a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. He had just started his first semester of classes and moments earlier had unexpectedly received a gift of US $100. It was a significant sum for him. Lord, I'm unworthy of this money. Vadim prayed. You have provided for all my needs and I lack nothing. Show me what to do with the money. Vadim exchanged the US dollars for Russian rubles. After tithe, 6,000 rubles remained. Vadim joined a small group of students who met once a week to pray and a few days later heard one of the students ask for prayers about his financial situation. Vadim listened silently. He didn't know the student and he didn't know how much money he needed for his tuition. That night, Vadim returned to the worship room to pray. Lord, he said, I would like to give the money to my classmate. Please bless this plan according to your will. The next day, Vadim pulled aside his classmate to speak privately. How much money do you need for your studies? he asked. Six thousand rubles, the classmate replied. Stunned, Vadim realised that God had answered his prayers. Not only that, but God had also answered the prayers of his classmate. Vadim joyfully gave the six thousand rubles to his astonished classmate. The two embraced. Two years later, the classmate has become one of Vadim's best friends. He and I have gone through a lot together, and he has helped me in so many ways, Vadim said in an interview. Thank God that I have acquired such a friend. Thank God that he takes care of our needs long before we even know that we have a need. Before we ask, he knows what to give and through whom to give it. The main thing is to trust him. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that he works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Ephesians three nineteen and 20. And there's a photograph of Vadim right here. The mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Spiritual growth, objective number five, to disciple individuals and families into spiritual lives and spiritual growth, objective number seven, to help youth and young adults place God first and exemplify a biblical worldview. And you can read more about these at IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.